Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Uh, today, we're uh, lucky to have as our special guest Andrew Weissman, who is the author of a new book, uh, Where Law Ends, Inside the Mueller Investigation. It's a book that's been getting a lot of attention in the news uh, and some criticism that we're going to discuss today with Andrew. Andrew, I want to begin uh, with the basic arguments you make in your book, that uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller, for whom you were a lead prosecutor, could have done more in his investigation. I'd like to ask you to focus in particular on the issue of President Trump's finances, which we're all thinking about in light of the New York Times revelatory story about the president's tax returns. As we look back at, at this story, isn't it important uh, that we know more about the president's finances? And why did Special Counsel Mueller observe the red line that President Trump announced uh, that would, he said prevented an inquiry into his personal finances. So first, let me thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, before I get to the direct answer uh, to your question, which is a really good one and obviously incredibly topical in light of the New York Times revelations, it's it's worth noting that, as I outlined in my book, all of the terrific accomplishments that were undertaken by the special counsel investigation under uh, Robert Mueller's leadership. Um, but that being said, there, there were areas where um, we didn't go and, um, you know, where I have my own personal views as to, as to what we should have done. Um, uh, but with respect to finances, it's a, it's a very um, interesting issue. Um, and it really goes to something that's very unusual in this case, which is we were investigating somebody who had the power to fire us. Uh, I've been a prosecutor for many, many years. I've prosecuted Enron executives. I, in New York City, I prosecuted organized crime figures. And those can be very challenging investigations. But one thing that those targets don't have is the ability to pull the plug on your investigation. And as you recall, David, early on, the White House had said that a red line was looking at the president's finances. Normally, as an investigator, of course, that's a bit of a red flag. Um, and so I recount in the book a scene where we had issued a subpoena with respect to Deutsche Bank. It was actually in connection with Manafort's finances, as to which we did do a financial investigation. And the special counsel had a difficult decision to make. One, I actually ended up, I personally agreed with it, um, which was at that point in the investigation, do you do the financial investigation and risk being fired um, and then not have the ability to do the great work that Team R, the Russia team did in, in uncovering how Russia interfered with our election, how it hacked into the DNC, um, how in the Manafort uh, team, we discovered that Manafort had been given, uh, had been giving uh, internal polling data to Konstantin Kalimnik, a Russian asset. Um, so the decision at that time was to um, not do that investigation. Where I respectfully uh, disagree is that I think that that decision needed to be revisited um, so that we had a fuller picture of the president's uh, potential links to Russia on the financial side um, and not just the matters that we had looked at. To be more specific, you note in your book that when the president and his lawyers uh, talked about this red line after you had uh, uh, issued a subpoena to Deutsche Bank for records about about Manafort. The response could have been, "Go pound sand. It's not it's not your call. It's our call." Uh, as you, as you say, you refrain from doing that. Looking back, if uh, the special counsel had issued subpoenas for wider records from Deutsche Bank, which at the time we believed was the president's principal uh, lender, what information do you think uh, uh, might have been obtained or to ask the question differently? What, what questions might have been answered that would be relevant to, to understanding the issues that the special counsel was asked to look at? Well, we were tasked with looking at all links 
between uh, the Trump campaign and the Russia government. That was in the appointment order uh, from Rod Rosenstein, the acting attorney general. So one of the questions is, um, were there any financial links? Um, and um, we did look when Michael Cohen uh, cooperated with our investigation, we did at that point look at um, the financial links with respect to um, the Trump Moscow project um, as to which there's been a, you know, a lot of reporting. But we don't know the answer to whether there are uh, whether there's financing from Russia of various Trump projects. We don't know whether the president's indebted in some way uh, to uh, Russian oligarchs. You know, one of the things that struck my attention in the New York Times reporting and assuming it's accurate is um, the Miss Universe pageant. Um, there's information in the New York Times reporting that um, the money to uh, sponsor that was put up by a Russian oligarch named Agalarov. And um, David, you may recall that that same oligarch was behind the Trump Tower meeting in June 2016. It was his emissaries who had set up that meeting to offer um, what they phrased in writing as dirt on Hillary Clinton. Um, and so one of the questions I had um, with respect to the New York Times reporting is, um, according to the New York Times, that Miss Universe pageant was unusually profitable, and yet the Aguilaris didn't seem to make any money off of it, even though they were the people who put up the money, but uh, then private citizen Trump had made a couple million dollars um, off of that. So that's something that, um, as an investigator, there certainly are, um, questions that you'd want to have you'd want to answer on that and and Andrew, just to, to be clear the new york times says that uh, the trump organization made i believe it was 2.3 million dollars from the 2013 miss universe pageant in in moscow and i take it from what you said that that was not a matter that was investigated by the special counsel am i right that's correct and why, why was that? In hindsight, it seems like a glaring uh, flashing light. Why wasn't there an effort to, 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 to ask questions, given that you were interested in the New York meeting that the Aguilarovs were involved in? So, as, as I mentioned, the decision um, early on was made um, by the special counsel to not um, go across that red line. And, you know, this is an area where um, I have great respect for Robert Mueller. Um, he certainly is motivated by all the right things, but I, I just have a disagreement as to uh, that area not being gone into and not revisiting the issue once our investigation um, grew and um, the, the risks of being fired um, to me uh, at that point did not outweigh needing to be um, uh, more thorough with respect to this particular area. But, but to be, just so I'm clear, did this issue of revisiting the financial matters come up later in the investigation? I understand that in the summer of 2017, when the president and his lawyers had enunciated the red line, decided not to cross it. Did you or did others specifically say later before the investigation concluded, we need to go back and look at that? Um, there were there were those discussions of needing to have a broader uh, financial investigation. And at that point, the decision was made to um, to wrap up the investigation without going into those things. Um, one of the things that I do think would have been important um, having made that decision. And again, just to be clear, I worked for somebody, it's their decision. Um, and, um, you know, I knew what I was getting into in that, in that sense. And that happens all the time that people disagree. I do think that the report, um, the written report could have been clearer about what we did and didn't do. Um, as you know, David, I was, I'm particularly critical of the attorney general and the way he characterized the report. Um, I think uh, one of the things he 
was a, he gave the impression that we had done sort of more than we had done. And I think it would have been useful if our report had been clearer about what we looked at and what we did not look at. On the question more broadly of the president's finances, as revealed by the New York Times investigation, you have, uh, as uh, general counsel of the FBI, as a prosecutor, I'm sure uh, had to obtain security clearances many times over the years. Yeah. If President Trump were an ordinary citizen, with the degree of indebtedness that we now know he uh, has, the New York Times figure is $421 million in personally guaranteed debt. W if you were a private citizen, not president, would he be able to obtain a security clearance without clear explanation uh, about that debt, where it comes from, and how he's going to pay it off? No. Um, you know, I'm not a security clearance expert, but um, that you would have a substantial number of questions about um, from a just simply a counterintelligence uh, perspective, you'd want to know a lot more about um, whether the person, a standard question is whether the person lives within their means. You want to know what kind of financial leverage somebody might have with respect to that person. So just for an average citizen, um, if you have any substantial debt, there are a whole series of standard questions that are asked to ascertain those kinds of risks. Um, and then, of course, depending on the answers, um, there could or could not be, uh, you know, you could get clearance, but um, you'd want to have make sure that that's fully vetted. And to be clear, was that a question of the president's potential vulnerability because of his uh, financial situation, well known that he that he had s substantial debts. W was that a subject that you, that you looked into in the in the course of your investigation? Whether no. whether he was vulnerable and could be in some way pressured. Um, that was not, as I mentioned, that the sort of a full financial uh, investigation was not something that was done. There were aspects that were done, as I mentioned, with respect to, for instance, Michael Cohen and the uh, Trump, uh, so-called Trump Tower uh, Moscow project. Um, but a full financial investigation to look into those issues was not done. Um, I know the subject of whether there was a counterintelligence investigation is one that has received some attention. And um, just to be clear, there was a mechanism where as we were doing um, what, what we were authorized to do um, within the parameters set by the Deputy Attorney General and Special Counsel Mueller, um, if there were counterintelligence leads, those were given to the FBI and their their um, their CI folks uh, to follow up on. On the question of obstruction of, of, of justice, uh, you said in the book, as I read it, that you think it was a mistake for uh, Special Counsel Mueller um, not to come to a conclusion to say, here's the evidence pro and con, but not to resolve it. Uh, do you think in your own mind, as one of his uh, lead uh, uh, prosecutors, that there was obstruction of justice in your judgment? So um, my personal judgment is that if you look at the facts that were outlined um, in our investigation, that I don't think a reasonable prosecutor looking at those could conclude that there was not obstruction of of justice. Um, that's a fancy way of saying that, you know, I think that a reasonable prosecutor would conclude that there was obstruction. Um, I do think there's a potential legal issue um, that a court would need to resolve whether the obstruction statute um, legally applies to the president. Um, there's some uh, academics who, you know, question that particular issue, although the statute on its face applies to any person. Um, but I just want to flag that that potential legal issue. But that's not a factual judgment. You mentioned earlier Attorney General Barr's uh, uh, rollout of your findings, uh, which you've argued was was misleading. You say in your book that uh, Special Counsel Mueller had spoken with Barr before the report was 
uh, completed and told him the, the sort of non-conclusion he was going to come to on obstruction of justice. Had Mueller also talked with Barr about the rollout and what Barr would say in presenting the findings? Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I don't believe so, um, based on what I know. But I don't know um, for sure um, the answer to that particular question. Um, I do know that um, I think everyone was very surprised by the four-page letter that was issued on March 24th, 2019, and the way it characterized the investigation and both what it said and what it didn't say. I, I should ask you to comment directly on, on Mueller's response this week to your book. He, he argued that it was based on, in his words, incomplete information. Uh, and he defended his, his judgments and conclusions saying that in effect, there were things that he knew that, that you didn't or, or, or didn't discuss in the book. What's what's your reaction to his comment? So I have no dispute with respect to um, the idea that I don't know everything that went on and I don't have the idea that um, there may be additional facts that are relevant and material. Um, and if that's the case, um, I think that's the kind of thing that any good investigator wants to consider all of the facts um, just the way a scientist um, would want to know additional facts. Um, and so um, what I was trying to do was be um, as candid and objective as I could be with respect to both the what we were facing from the outside, um, coming from either the White House or the president or Attorney General Barr, and then with respect to what we did, how we met those challenges and um, pointing out where I thought that we were very successful and did a really good job, but I also didn't want to be Pollyannish. And I knew that it meant that I had to sort of hold up a mirror to things I did and other people did to point out areas where I thought um, we could have done better. And I think that conversation, um, particularly as it relates to the special counsel regulations, um, is an important one to have. And I think from a, uh, if you step back and take it out of the political maelstrom that we're in right now and think about it from a systemic point of view in terms of are the special counsel rules working, this is a really good time for us to be thinking about um, do they need to change um, and are there um, stumbling blocks and hurdles that were placed before us that really um, it would behoove us to figure out how to make them better. And just to, to be on a, a, a bit of a um, uh, diatribe on this, you know, if you think about it historically, you can see where we are in terms of Watergate happening and the creation of the independent council rules in light of the um, Saturday Night Massacre and then the special counsel rules um, being put in place um, in light of the experience with the independent counsel law, um, including the Ken Starr investigation. And this is a good time to reflect on whether the special counsel rules um, can work in uh, this kind of situation, because God forbid we're in this situation again, um, you really do want to have the, the best mechanisms to avoid, um, I think, avoid the repetition of what happened here. So uh, if there are specific reform suggestions, uh, tell us. But I, I want to ask you in the, in the course of that to respond to another criticism that was made of your, of your book uh, in the Washington Post today by Attorney Randall Eliason. He said he thought it was a betrayal of, of Mueller, your boss, uh, but he also argued, I think more broadly, that uh, we should be concerned about uh, overly aggressive or uh, overly public discussions by prosecutors uh, that we've we've had experience. The Ken Starr investigation is an example, but the, but there are others, um, and that discretion has its value. 
uh, for a prosecutor, just like a, a former a former intelligence uh, official. How would you respond to, to, to Eliasson's critique? So I think I think that's a, a good debate to have. I think that if we were talking about it, an investigation that was in, entirely secret um, and you were doing an investigation and nothing came of it, um, that that would make a lot of sense to me that you would not um, malign somebody in that way. But this is a very different situation because the attorney general with White House consent had made the report public. Um, and so to my mind, I guess I don't view either dissent or debate or discussion about what worked and what didn't work as a betrayal. I think um, it's important for what I would call the public education function of the justice system for people to understand what happened. Um, you know, I I was brought up as did, with a lot of history in my background, and I studied it in college. And I really thought it was necessary to record um, for the historical record what happened in the same way that there were numerous uh, precedents for this, going back to Watergate and other you know celebrated investigations and trials. Um, and I thought that um, if there wasn't an accounting from the inside, um, we were gonna be left with speculation and conspiracy theories. And I thought it was important to try to have a sober reflection on um, what worked, what challenges there were, and what might work better going forward. I should say that I, as a, as a reader of your book, uh, and somebody who's followed this story from the beginning, found the discussion very helpful. Uh, journalists always want more information, uh, not not less. I want to ask you about a, a criticism that the president's defenders have made repeatedly in different ways, and that is their argument that the FBI uh, overstepped uh, proper in investigation bounds uh, in aspects uh, of this investigation going back to 2016. One uh, particular that's been cited is is the uh, way in which the foreign intelligence surveillance warrant on Carter Page was obtained. The record's pretty clear that some of the information that was used was inaccurate and that the FBI's standards were not what we would expect. You used to be general counsel of the FBI. I want to ask you, were you troubled by uh, any of the information that surfaced about, about how the FBI conducted its investigation in the beginning before the Mueller uh, investigation was chartered back, back in 2016? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to put on my you know, former general counsel hat. Um, this is an area I really care deeply about. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm very concerned. I think that any time that you're making representation, representations to the court, you need to be meticulous and scrupulous and you need to front um, both the positive and negative evidence. And that's particularly true in ex parte applications, meaning ones where there is, there's no adversary. Um, and one thing that I am a huge proponent of is particularly when it comes to national security applications where um, those may never see the light of the day. They may never be subjected to um, uh, adversary challenge. I think it's very, very useful to have another voice there. Um, and, you know, there is an amicus process in the FISA court, but um, I think it would be really useful to have that expanded in a way um, that um, has more rigor um, and more routine um, adversary process by lawyers who are, you know, pre-screened in order to, so that they have the necessary clearance. Um, and I'm sorry about, um, we talked about um, 
uh, my dog uh, and uh, <laughs> the fact that I have his 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 bed in in, sh in the shot. So um, well, hope that's not too distracting. Well, we we will we're happy to 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 see your dog. The the uh, one final thing I want to uh, ask you about that Republican uh, senators and others have have uh, questioned is whether the Mueller prosecution team wiped its cell phones in a way that was uh, inappropriate uh, during or at the conclusion of the investigation. I'm sure, sure you've seen uh, these allegations. What about them? Is, were the phones wiped? Why? Uh, what's the, the quick response to that? So the, the quick response is, and I, I really um, would hope that the Department of Justice would get out in front of this because um, as I write about in my book, we had every concern about retaining as much evidence as possible. And we were very concerned having looked at Watergate about what would happen if we were summarily fired. And we did um, all sorts of things to make sure that our records, both electronic and hard copy, would be preserved um, in various locations. So um, I, I actually think this is um, kind of a, I mean, I understand why there's a story because there's a document that says phones um, you know, needed to be reset and there were the material on the phone um, was erased, but everything was backed up. And I know personally my stuff was backed up because there were numerous FOIA requests for everything um, on my phones for four years. And I remember having to go through with FBI lawyers, all of my calendars. So, you know, whether something's on a particular handheld device, it all was on my, you know, in my case, I know it was on my computer. So I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, um, this will prove to be a non-story. Thanks, thanks for responding to that. We have just a little time left. I'm just going to ask you a simple, straightforward question. You, uh, I'm, I'm told, are a lifelong Republican. I want to ask you why it is that Republicans have been so reluctant, in some cases unwilling, to hold President Trump accountable for some of his actions, the actions that you investigated carefully along with Special Counsel Mueller. Why is that? So that goes beyond my my expertise, but one thing I do write about and I've experienced and I re I think about is when when I was involved in the Enron prosecution, I used to think about the Enron case that it was not good for the media to focus on the more salacious aspects of it in terms of what Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling and Andy Faster were doing. To me, the story was, how did they get away with this? Who are the people who are enabling or complicit or didn't speak up? Um, it was about those enablers. Where were the guardrails? And I think there is an analogy here because there there can be people who, uh, you know, do things that are uh, improper or even illegal, but we're supposed to have um, checks and balances and people are supposed to stand up for, um, you know, the rule of law. Um, as somebody who's been in the Department of Justice for, you know, over two decades, you know, it's dispiriting to see those guardrails not being adhered to. Helpful answer. A uh, very interesting conversation. I want to thank our guest, uh, Andrew Weissman. Uh, his new book, Where Law Ends, uh, is uh, rightly getting a lot of uh, discussion uh, around the country. We're really glad to have had some of that discussion today on Washington Post Live. So, so thank you to, to, to Andrew. Uh, I'll be back on Monday uh, for an interview with Dara Khosrowshawi, uh, who is the CEO of Uber company that we, we all know well. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week and the weekend. We'll look forward to seeing you on Monday.